look, I'm, I'm, my, my day job is I'm, I'm a GP and I'm now um, actually morphed into an academic, so I'm now head of the Department of General Practice at the medical school here. Um, I have worked um, as an expert witness uh, for, for both the Crown and the Defence, um, more recently obviously just for the Defence, um, and more recently still I'm, I act as a medical advisor rather than an expert witness, but it's a very small part of what I do. Um, I'm, a, tra I'm a, a vocationally trained GP, but I'm also a vocationally trained forensic physician, so um, I do have that other string to my bow. So um, what I'm going to talk about today really is about um, some of my experiences from the cases I've worked on, and in particular I'm going to draw on the one, one particular case. But I'm, I'm looking at them through a sort of psychological lens of um, how, they, um, how cognitive biases can actually shape evidence. Um, and when you've got co cognitive dissonance, um, this is when you've got conflicting information, and human beings find that really distressful. <coughs> and so... Um, it incre it, it, when you meet that sort of situation, there's an increased conviction that you're right, and it becomes very hard to retract. So um, we strive for internal consistency, um, and if we experience inconsistencies, then we try to reduce our dissonance by um, actively avoiding um, information that may contradict uh, uh, what we believe. And alongside that, there's um, a confirmatory bias where um, we... <coughs> Excuse me. We look for, we interpret, um, and we recall information that, um, that, that actually confirms our pre-existing uh, belief, uh, and that any other information we ignore or suppress. Uh, and so what this, what this does is that once you've got this belief that a crime's been committed, or that someone's a perpetrator, then you've got this unconscious bias uh, to selectively present or interpret evidence, and it's how we operate as humans and it leads to tunnel vision. Um, and if you really want to know about cognitive dissonance, this is an amazingly good book to read. Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me, by um, Carol Tavris. Um, she's just put out a new edition. But it's, it's an amazingly good read, and it's full of cases. Uh, and it really illustrates how this shapes um, uh, how we see the world, really. So what this leads to is um, good and what I call good and bad science. And, and the, the scientific principle, good science, is where you formulate a hypothesis and you test it with experiments to confirm or, or refute. And that's the principle um, espoused by Dubot. Uh, but bad science occurs when you've got a preconceived belief in the truth and therefore your investigations are just designed to only find um, evidence and information that supports it. And this, this can lead to a distorting evidence to fit, or um, so you, you, you massage evidence to make it fit your preconceived idea, um, or you exclude it when it doesn't. And both prosecution and defence can do this. Um, and, uh, and distorting evidence to twist the truth or leaving out evidence if it doesn't fit the case. And in my work, um, uh, it's commonplace um, operating the forensic cases that I've worked in, um, and to a greater or lesser degree. Um, I'm going to draw on the Guaze case um, that I worked on as an example, and that's what the book's about, and it talks in more depth about the sort of principles I'm talking about today. Um, and the book includes sort of the legal ramifications of, of, of some of these things. But, you know, I'm, um, I'm in a different situation to a barrister. Um, I will look at a case... And I will only want to work on a case if I can see the evidence suggests reasonable doubt. So there has to be um, significant evidence suggesting reasonable doubt for me to want to take on a case. Whereas, you know, barristers, I mean, you, 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 you defend someone regardless of, um, you know, if they want a defence, that, that, that's, your, that's your role. So it's a different role for me. So I see a very biased sample. So where there's, there's considerable reasonable doubt, there's... there's I'm going to see a significantly high, higher number of people who are uh, um, uh, being falsely prosecuted than, than your average barrister, because it's very selective. So this is the case of George uh, Guaze, um, uh, and um, you, many of you will probably know, I'm sure you'll know about this case, but I'm just going to go through it in a, in a little bit of, to, 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 to give the story. So <coughs> it was the case of Charlene Macaza, and she, had, she was... She was um, 
she was born in Zimbabwe in 1996 and she had a, a, a sister, Charmaine, who was two years older. And in 1997, when she was a baby, she was adopted by her aunt and uncle, Sofiso and George Guaze, because her parents had died uh, in their 30s of what was called immune deficiency illness, which uh, no, one in, uh, no one in Zimbabwe would ever talk about actually having HIV AIDS. When, when she was nine, she immigrated to New Zealand with a family and they settled in Christchurch. Um, and um, in January 2007, when she was just turned 10, her, her mother, her aunt, mother, Sofiso, um, came early in the morning, found her in bed, unconscious, gasping for breath, with a very high fever, and the bed was awash with diarrhoea. Um, and her, her sister, 20-year-old um, Nathando, was in a bed, it was less than a metre away, um, and they pulled her out of bed, um, tried to dress her, too, too messy, put a towel around her, rushed her to the, um, uh, the A&M, and then um, uh, uh, she went to an A&M, and then she went to the hospital, and then she went to the ESR. And they worked on her, um, uh, assuming that she had septic shock. She was, you know, she was, she was, she was, uh, um, all the signs of sepsis. And so they, um, they, they managed to get a line into her, um, put in uh, fluids, got her blood pressure up. She had no recordable blood pressure when she arrived. Uh, they gave her lots of IV antibiotics, they gave her antifungals, they gave her antivirals. Um, and they assumed that she was, this was some sort of overwhelming infection that she was dying from. Um, um, and they, they sent a helicopter down from uh, the uh, paediatric intensive care unit at Starship because uh, they're going to transfer her up there because Christchurch doesn't have um, uh, that degree of support. But when she was in ICU, uh, there were some nurses who actually wanted to put in a rectal thermometer because the temperature was, had started off at 40 and it was clearly dropping. Um, uh, as she got lots of fluid on board and actually as, as she was dying. Um, and they couldn't get a rectal thermometer in, so they rolled her over um, and they saw what they thought was a seven centimetre um, tear of her rectum. And they, the paediatrician was called, lots of other people were called, and they looked at it and they saw, that they, they saw this uh, red meaty um, uh, area around her anal, in her anal region and were horrified. It was emotionally looked terrible. They thought this, must, this girl must have been raped. Must have been, uh, this is what's caused it. Um, and they wondered if um, therefore the infection was because from this rape there had actually been penetration into her bowel and the bowel had been perforated, made a hole and that was the source of the infection. So they called a paediatric surgeon to come and have a look. And he examined her, and he didn't see a rectal tear. Um, he, and he certainly didn't see a bowel tear, so he said there's no tear at all, um, there's, but there's some tiny splits around the margin of the anus. They're about one to two millimetres, little splits around the anus, but nothing that was seven centimetres. Um, and so the doctors said, well, okay, they're still fixated that there's a tear. Um, she must have been sexually violated, and because she's not dying from inf infection, from a perforated bowel, she must have been suffocated. And so, uh, in their minds, she now, it was now a case of um, a tear, uh, sexual violation, and, and attempted murder. At the same time, uh, the, all the blood tests came back, and she came back as HIV positive. But that sort of got, uh, that, that didn't fit the diagnosis of, um, uh, of sexual violation and suffocation. Um, so they could, the, the child was in intensive care. The, heli the, the helicopter arrived. They decided they couldn't do anything, so they wouldn't transfer her. She was clearly, she, had to, she was going to die. There was nothing they could do to save her. Uh, so they called the police. They called the DZAC doctor. They called the pathologist, who was to do the, the autopsy after she died. Um, and they, so they started an investigation. Uh, and so they interviewed, all the family were there in the hospital, so they took them into separate rooms and they started interviewing them, um, and they secured the house as a crime scene. Um, and, um, I mean, the family were being interviewed when she died, some of them, um, uh, but she died in the early hours of the next morning, uh, and, um, uh, and from then on it was, it was a case of rape and murder. Um, and... Um, Subsequent to that, um, uh, I mean, the, basically it was always who's done this. 
Could it be, you know, her, her, her adopted father, George, or his, um, George Jr., who was um, his son aged about 22? Um, or could, had there been an intruder? Now, George was, George Iguaze was very clear that no one could have got into this house. It was very well secured. He was very good at locking doors. So, so therefore, it could only be, the only suspects left were George Sr. or George Jr. Um, and then a few days later, um, ESR came up with sperm that, um, uh, uh, from a pair of Charlene's underpants that had been washed, uh, matching George uh, Senior. And so therefore, um, clearly it must be George Senior and he was charged with sexual violation or homicide and remanded in custody and in solitary confinement. Now George always categorically denied the charges. Uh, but the medical opinion that this was a case of rape and murder it was always a whodunit, not, never looking at, well, was this actually rape? There was no rectal tear. How come, um, you know, um, maybe there was, uh, there was may, maybe this child did die of infection, which was the, the, the original assumption. Uh, but the police and the forensic pathologist were, were, were never given the option that this, maybe it's natural causes, maybe it's, um, you know, it's rape and murder. Uh, it was always, this is the only thing it could be. So that was what they were presented with. Um, and in the media, the day she died, it was in the media that this child had, um, had, had, had died from, um, from this violence. Um, and so from the start, in the evidence that supported this, this child might have died from natural causes was never sought or it was ignored. Um, th there's a number of cases that I found that are sort of quite salient in this, uh, you know, of, of aspects that are salient in this case. Um, one of the things that, that disturbed me was that the paediatrician who, who, um, who looked after this child in her last uh, few hours of her life um, was also the key expert witness for the prosecution. And I think that's, um, that to me is not appropriate because when you're, when you're a doctor looking after a patient, you're in your therapeutic role um, and your responsibility is to care for the patient, it's for advocacy for your patient. And when you're um, being a forensic doctor, being able to give expert witness in court, then your primary responsibility is to the court, it's not to your patient. Um, and your job is to provide objective and unbiased evidence. And it's extremely hard to do that if you've actually been a clinician looking after somebody. So that to me is, I mean, I don't believe that, that you should combine those two roles. Um, another issue that was very difficult in this case is that I'm sure you all know, but New Zealand's very small um, and it's very hard often to get experts for the defence. Um, and even if there are people who might have the expertise, it's such a small country that um, uh, many professionals would be reluctant to challenge their peers and actually, um, and it, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not for the faint hearted to be an expert witness. Um, it, it, it's, I've, nev I've never found it a very pleasant experience. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's something that people don't necessarily want to leap into, into doing. So just in terms of the case, um, so she died January 2007 and the, the first trial was um, May 2008 uh, and there were, there were three prosecution expert witnesses, one of whom was the, um, the paediatrician. Uh, oh, no, so three of them who, who were there submitted their final briefs only after the trial had started, which, um, uh, which I found really difficult because I had to look at this material and, uh, and respond to it. Um, and there was additional briefs of, like one had 54 extra pages that came in after the trial had started. Um, and the forensic pathologist only gave the final brief um, the day he gave evidence. So that, that sort of made it um, a, a really high pressure situation to have to actually assimilate this material and, and respond to it um, in such a short time. Um, so the Crown's case was that the girl had been raped and murdered um, and the doctors and the nurses in the case continued to claim this gaping wound to the rectum um, despite the evidence that it didn't exist. Now I'll tell you what, actually, what they actually saw, which looks horrifying, is that um, this girl was dying and the, the anus, which is usually quite constricted with the sphincter, you know, sort of pulled right in, those muscles had all relaxed because she was so close to death that there was no tone to the, to the anus. So it actually gaped open. So you could see um, inside the lining of the rectum 
the, the anal canal and the rectum just by looking at it. It was just the sort of open bowel. Um, it did have some little tiny splits, fissures around the edges, um, and it, it was an unusual colour. It was really red. And, and it was why it was really red was because this girl had very, very advanced HIV. And um, what HIV does is it increases your risk of infection, but it also damages all the linings of your body, and particularly the lining of the bowel, but also the lining of your lungs and um, uh, um, uh, 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 your eyes and your, your gums, it, everywhere. Um, and it's, it, it destroys the tissue. And so the, the, the lining, those linings get very thin and they, they, get, they look very red, they don't look normal. And so what they saw, what they thought this is this meaty, great gaping wound, which wasn't actually bleeding, was actually this very unusual um, uh, lining of the bowel in a girl where the, the bowel had relaxed. Um, so the, 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 um, the, the Crown said that the fact that she was HIV was completely irrelevant. Uh, now, she was HIV not from being sexually violated, of course, she was HIV because she was born that way, because her parents died of HIV. And so this, and, and no one ever contested that. I mean, George didn't have HIV. None of the other family, her older sister didn't have it, but, but she actually got it from her mother before death. Um, so that, that had always been who, part of her. Um, uh, and so the defence case was she actually died from HIV and from overwhelming infection, and there was so much evidence that she had overwhelming infection, including the diarrhoea and the fever, uh, but a whole lot of test uh, uh, results as well. Um, the Crown, since, since the case that it was George, was the sperm found on the underpants. Now, we're talking very, very small amounts of DNA detected, um, and the defence case was Actually, um, if you examine um, uh, uh, clothing from a family wash, particularly cotton, um, you will find um, uh, the sperm from the household. Um, uh, you're likely to find them on the clothes because it gets transferred in the wash. What's more, you wash a garment um, that has sperm on it, uh, and um, every time you wash it, you lose about 40%. So it actually it takes quite a long time to get rid of it. Um, the, the, the sperm actually, particularly cotton, not so much a nylon, but cotton, they, they stick to the, to the fibres. So that was the case. It took about three weeks. Um, the jury heard the evidence. I, I didn't give evidence. And the, we didn't have any expert witnesses for the defence. Um, it was purely on um, the skills of the, um, of the uh, defence barrister, Jonathan Eaton, um, who actually managed to bring out all the evidence that this girl had, um, had overwhelming infection. But of course, that wasn't the end of it. Um, there, I'm not going to go into the details, but there was a, um, an issue that happened right at the end that allowed um, uh, um, uh, a challenge as a technicality in the process of, of, of that trial. Um, but uh, the Charmaine, who was two years older than her sister, um, uh, had been taken into care as soon as her sister died. So she had actually been taken away from this family that she'd been brought up in and was living in foster care. Um, and after the trial, so the trial was in May, in August, um, Charmaine was now 13, a uh, family court hearing, and they decided, even though he'd been acquitted, that um, uh, um, on the balance of probabilities, he'd actually done it. Um, and therefore, she was made a ward of the state and wasn't going to be allowed to see her family until she was 20. Um, uh, the following year, in August, um, the, was a, there was an appeal case. Uh, it was just the the, the um, Crown appeal was dismissed by the Court of Appeal, uh, but the following May, um, it went to the Supreme Court and they uh, quashed their acquittal and they ordered a retrial. Now, of course, after that, um, there was the earthquake and that... Um, put a huge delay on things, I mean, the courts and the police station and the, uh, the barristers' rooms and everything were within the red zone. So it took a while until they had the second trial, which was not till May 2012, so that was four years after the first. Um, after the acquittal the second time, um, uh, Charmaine had, um, she went back to the family court and she managed to have the order overturned and so she could get, get to see her family again. Um, she's now uh, training as a lawyer. She wants to make sure this never happens to anyone else ever again. Uh, but um, I think she might have 
finished, actually. She's, they're, and they're a very amazing family. Um, Nothando, the one who found, um, uh, uh, who was asleep uh, in the bed very close to where, this, uh, where her, her sister was, you know, was found almost dead. I mean, she's, she's now been admitted to the bar about two years ago. So, uh, she did that training in between the two trials. The only thing that still is still, we're still outstanding is the coronial hearing. Um, and, and there's no date for that yet. So, I mean, she, she died uh, nearly 10 years ago. And, um, and the family are still on hold because that, that's the last one to go. We, the, the, there's still no date. But anyway, um, one of the interesting things about this case was, as you'll probably know, that it was um, a test of double jeopardy in a way because um, uh, uh, George had been acquitted of rape and murder and the same evidence was going forth to the, to the next trial. Um, and they just, the court decided that double jeopardy only applies after the uh, prosecution has exhausted all, all, um, all avenues for appeal. So that was sort of a test of it um, in New Zealand as far as, I, from what I understand. Um, so some of the other issues that happened in this case were, um, there, there were, there were, um, uh, there were delays in disclosure in the second trial as well. Um, so the first trial, um, clearly the, the, the fact that we only got briefs while the trial was going on, um, they, since then they'd had the Criminal Disclosure Act. Um, uh, but so before the second trial, but the second trial was in, it started in April 2012, uh, but in February 2012, um, the prosecution disclosed um, they'd done huge amounts of testing at the ESR between the trials, and it was over four and a half, it was about four and a half thousand pages um, of evidence, uh, plus a CD of DNA profiles um, that, the, that they got um, for, it wasn't for me to look at, it was for uh, my colleague Ari Gerson, who's a DNA expert, to actually have to um, look at this and, uh, you know, and, and, and see what the tests they'd done and what it all meant uh, before the trial. So that was sort of a huge task, actually. Um, the, the other bit of evidence that came forth at the, at the end of the trial, uh, uh, the, just before the second trial, was that when, the, when, when Charlene was dying, there was uh, a microbiologist at the hospital who was doing, do, analysing all her blood tests. Uh, and he was the one who suggested, actually, they test her for HIV because he'd previously worked in Africa. And he said it was indisputable that there was evidence of overwhelming sepsis from all the markers and the blood tests and, and all the things that he'd seen. But um, the, the defence were unaware of him and, um, and he wasn't called at the first trial. And just before the second trial, two weeks before the second trial, the police and the, and the Crown witnesses um, ha, um, had a teleconference with him uh, uh, but he insisted, no, I mean, I don't know about the, the you know, I, don't, I can't explain the, the, the seven centimetre tear, but there's no doubt that this girl had overwhelming sepsis. So the Crown chose not to call him, um, and his report that he'd written and completed in February 2011 was only disclosed to the defence um, 10 days before the second trial. So again, this sort of, uh, you know, being tardy with, the, um, with disclosure, really. Um, we decided at the second trial that we really had to have some expert witnesses um, and the prosecution were calling two overseas forensic pathologists. And so I, I went to England for, um, for other you know, university business and while I was there I found some experts who would be prepared to look at this case and in particular there was the world expert in histopathology who'd done um, over a thousand autopsies and looked at the, 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 the um, microscope uh, slides of of people with HIV, and um, so he actually got the um, got the blocks of tissue from the forensic pathologist in New Zealand and cut and stained new slides and, and looked at them. Um, I also got a, pediat a pediatrician who uh, worked in London with expertise in inf infectious disease and HIV, and someone who worked in the intensive care unit as a pediatrician with experience of HIV, and also a home office pathologist. Um, the, the, the Sebastian Lucas, who was the HIV expert, he, he, when he looked at the slides, he, could, he, he said, I'd never seen such a florid case. He couldn't believe the amount of HIV damage and the amount of, you know, that he saw in every type of tissue that he looked at. Um, the the defence had extreme difficulty getting any legal aid for these experts. Um, so um, they were actually instructed with, you know, without approval um, and one of them actually, Sebastian and Lucas, actually came to Christchurch um, uh, the, and the others joined by video link. 
but his travel was only approved one, one week before the trial. So it was all, again, very sort of uh, uh, pushed in terms of time. So second trial, four years later, and again, um, there was now an awful lot of ESR evidence that they, they had tested sheets and clothing and um, underpants found in the bedroom, all sorts of things. The doctors um, and nurses were still, st even in the second trial, they still talked about this great gaping wound, um, even though the pedi pediatric surgeon actually gave evidence again to say there was no tear. Um, but but that, was, that was their reality, that that's what they'd seen and they couldn't get it out of their minds, it was so horrifying. They still said HIV was irrelevant, um, but the forensic scientist, um, having looked at Ari Gerson's report and having um, done a lot of testing, she actually conceded that, um, uh, that, that, that the sperm that she'd found could, um, it could have come from the wash, that it, wasn't, it didn't actually indicate sexual assault. Um, and so our, uh, the defence case was, was similar to the, the previous one, um, and he, he was acquitted again. Um, so when I look at these sort of cases, and when I, I mean, when I first got, when I, I was first contacted, uh, just, it was just after depositions in the first, before the first trial, um, I had read the media and I thought, you know, sperm on the underpants and this huge wound um, must be guilty. Um, but I, you know, I had, I had a look at the evidence, and once I sort of saw that actually, well, there was no tear, um, and I also um, looked at the literature on um, on transfer of sperm in the wash, and um, it, it's clearly that there was that there, were, there was more than one possible explanation. Um, but but when, what, the way I operate with this is I get all the evidence, all sorts of evidence, um, and I put it in order of a timeline so I can get every event, and I. I cross-reference every bit of evidence I have, um, and then I look to see what's not there. And in this case, there was a huge amount not there, but you know, what, what, what sort of evidence might be available that actually might fill in some of those gaps? Um, and so, this, so if the, the, sort of, the sort of things that weren't there were, that there, were, there were all the statements from the doctors, but there weren't the clinical notes from the hospital. Um, uh, and when I got those, they, you know, it showed the temperature and all the other signs that actually supported infection. And when I managed to get the lab and x-ray results, um, there was clearly, um, from the x-rays, um, uh, evidence of, um, of infection in her brain, um, in her sinuses, in her mastoids, in her ears, uh, pneumonia in the lung, um, uh, signs of infection in the bowel, and then the blood tests all confirmed that. They were, they were, they were very disordered blood tests that just, that just screamed out, you know, sepsis, sepsis. Um, I also managed to get um, the forensic notes, which I had, you know, often you don't, often you only get the statement from the doctor. What you need to do is look at the actual notes they took at the time, because there's a lot of information there that won't necessarily be in their statement. Uh, and I also managed to get the photos. And once I got the photos, and I could see what, what had happened, I could see how you could see this, this photograph of the anal region. I could see how you could look at that and be horrified and think it's a tear. But actually, uh, I could also see what it really was. Um, uh, the, the tests that they did, um, uh, uh, but they tested her for microorganisms, but they didn't find any. They didn't find any source of infection. But of course, quite rightly, they had previously given her antibiotics and antivirals and antifungals. So you don't necessarily expect to find, um, uh, to be able to pick up a bug that will grow once you've done that. Um, the, the, the one thing that would have had some sort of bug on it that you could have possibly detected was the towel that she was wrapped in and raced to the A&M, and it actually was uplifted by the police from the rubbish bin from the A&M. And of course, she hadn't had any antibiotics by then, and it was absolutely drenched in diarrhea. Um, uh, but they took the towel, and they tested it for semen, which was negative, and they tested it for blood, which was negative. But because they weren't looking for infection, they didn't test it for infection, um, because, because that was at, they, they were only looking for rape murder. Um, the, the pathologist, um, uh, you know, there, there was also uh, supposed to be a vaginal tear, a hymenal tear, uh, and I had somebody look at those slides and said, there's no tear there that I can see. Um, the pathologist hadn't even looked at that, 
um, until the, during the first trial, and when the, when this evidence was suggested that there was no well, there was no tear on it. Um, it was only then that, 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 that he actually looked at that, um, those slides. Um, so the sequence of events um, from the prosecution witnesses was that A&M, they presumed that it was sepsis, lots of diarrhoea. There was a spot of blood on the glove when they, went, they put a, two, two paracetamol suppositories to try and bring the nanotemperature. temperature. Everybody said they hadn't wiped her bottom. When she got to the emergency room, they presumed sepsis. No one saw the rectal tear. Uh, and no one could recall seeing any diarrhea, but they also didn't see any blood. Um, in the ICU, they saw this tear. Um, most saw no diarrhea, um, but subsequent to that, a doctor, when you read the clinical notes, a doctor and a nurse subsequently noted that, the, um, that she was drenched in diarrhea and there was a pool in the bed. But, so basically, there was disappearing diarrhea, that she was drenched in it, and the evidence from the family and from the A&M and from that towel that was uplifted, there was too much to wipe away. It was just pouring out. But many staff later had no recollection of seeing or smelling it. And no one admitted wiping it off. And um, because it didn't fit with the idea of rape and murder, this profuse diarrhea. So it sort of, it sort of got blinkered off from their, their process. It's not, I'm not saying deliberately, it's just what happens. When, in the record of her death at Christchurch Hospital, there was no mention. They said that she, um, they actually said that she presented unconscious um, with um, rectal bleeding. That was, that's what was in the, the, the death notice when I got it. Um, and experts for, started to talk about, in the, in the Crown case, they talked about so-called diarrhea. Um, and in the second trial, the paediatrician said there was no diarrhea, it was just a little bit of sloughing of the bowel. Um, but the evidence was overwhelming that it, you know, it sort of disappeared. But on the other hand, rectal bleeding took, took this prime position. Now, there was a spot of blood reported on, the, um, uh, on the, the tip of the finger of the, uh, the nurse putting in the suppositories, but they didn't see any uh, blood in the emergency room, they didn't see any blood in the ICU, there was no blood on the bed sheets where she was found, and it tested negative, the towel tested negative. However, the, as I say, the record of death said she presented unconscious with rectal bleeding because they expected it to be. You had a tear this big, it's huge. You'd expect massive amount of bleeding. Um, the other thing that, that, that sort of concerns me about some of these cases um, that, that the terminology shapes the evidence. So um, there's an implied guilt from, um, from, the, from the beginning, and this has happened in many cases I work on, the complainant is called a victim. So that's an assumption um, that, you know, that, 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 that whatever, I mean, it depends on the case, but it's an assumption that the complainant, something really did happen. And the defendants are called the perpetrator. And to me, that they're not perpetrators until they've been convicted. Um, so that's just sort of the way language can shape things. And in this case, um, they, that these um, lesions on the anal margin, which were actually just the breakdown of tissue due to... Um, having massive diarrhea and HIV and just sort of generally dying, you get these little um, tiny splits to the, you know, to the tissue as it breaks down. But they were called tears, tears or lacerations, which are terminology which suggests trauma. It doesn't suggest natural causes. Um, the, the, the sort of blinkering that happened that I saw that concerned me was that when the Crown, my Crown experts from the UK, uh, uh, the defence experts from the UK, when they, they couldn't believe this case was going to go ahead once they'd seen the evidence. And they had, you know, they were coming from a very neutral position because they were just, knew nothing about this case until they got the evidence. They thought, well, once, you know, once we give our reports, then um, clearly um, this, the, well, the, the, the charges must be dropped. Um, uh, but they, the, the, the Crown uh, experts didn't read their reports. Uh, they didn't, wouldn't agree to having uh, a teleconference part of the trial with these experts. Um, and they didn't, the pathologists didn't look at the microscope slides that the HIV um, uh, uh, expert had made uh, because he said um, HIV is irrelevant. So why would we talk with these experts? Because we know it's not nothing to do with HIV. So, so it's that whole sort of cognitive dissonance um, uh, effect, really. There was also attempts to sort of really keep the, the evidence uh, on, on only trauma. Um, so the, the ESR scientist who did all those extra tests, and she actually had a, a master's student who, um, 
who did a thesis looking at hand washing a pair of underpants with stained with semen um, and with some pristine underpants, and actually demonstrate because that's actually how this little girl's underpants were washed. That her mother, Safiso, would wash uh, Charlene uh, her own and George's underpants in a, in a bucket. Um, the rest of the family would put them in the wash, but she used to hand wash them. So hand washing was the issue, and there was nothing in the literature about hand washing. So this master's student actually did the study and showed you could transfer it in the wash. Um, but the, the prosecutor asked them to, to remove that from the report because it was only, um, it had been, it, she'd got a master's thesis, but it was not published in the peer-reviewed literature. Although it did demonstrate that hand washing can, you know, can transfer. Um, and she was also asked to, uh, by the police to remove from her file the correspondence about this uh, case, the pages of her report. Um, uh, because it actually talked about hand washing and the, the, the study and, and various other things, and that she had expressed many doubts uh, about um, about, the, about the fact that this was this, the sperm was due to sexual contact. Um, to her credit, she refused to remove them, and so that's how the defence knew because we got the entire uh, file, including her comments that she'd been asked to remove them. <laughs> But um, you know, there was a shift, looking at the from the first trial to the second trial was again very interesting. There was a shift in recall. Now this is again not deliberate, this is what happens with people over time, your, your memories change. Um, uh, and because they were fixed, really believed that this, I mean they truly believed this child was the victim of trauma. And so by the second trial, the forensic pathologist um, he gave evidence uh, that there were bruising and tears to the sphincter, to the anal sphincter, um, and that her anus had failed because of trauma, um, and that there were all these pinpoint little hemorrhage spots in her bowel that stopped abruptly at 7.5 centimetres, suggesting that this was from penile penetration. Um, but actually, when you looked at his original autopsy report, and he was reminded of it, and the photographs that he'd taken, um, the, he, he never mentioned bruising or trauma to the sphincter. There was no evidence of it in his actual autopsy report. Um, or um, He never mentioned failed anus. Um, and the photographs showed that these pinpoint spots actually continued all the way up. But they got lesser and lesser and lesser. So you could see that um, in the first two or three centimetres there, there were lots. And that was just the nature of, um, the, they're almost certainly due to the HIV infiltration of the mucosa. Um, but that, his recall had changed over that time, and he hadn't actually refreshed himself by looking at the, his actual report. So that became, that was his reality. And again, the, um, the, the DZAC doctor talked about a hymenal tear that was oozing blood. Um, but, but this was not visible in the photos, and she'd never mentioned it in, her, in any of her previous reports. So this only came out in the second trial. And it's sort of how recall can change. I mean, there was no hymenal tear oozing blood. So, um, okay. so in medicine, really, um, th th there's two sort of principles I want to talk about. One's Occam's razor, and this is the principle of parsimony, and this is where you actually <coughs> excuse me, um, look for a single diagnosis to explain all the problems that you're seeing. And so, in this particular case, um, they, the perceived rectal tear led to this theory of death caused by suffocation, although there was no evidence of suffocation on the autopsy. It doesn't mean to say it didn't happen and that you don't always get evidence of suffocation. It's not, it's not uh, there can be, but it also may not be on it. But, um, you know, this child actually was not suffocated when she, um, when she was found. She was gasping for breath, so it was only, would have only been partial suffocation. Um, but also, there were incompatible signs and symptoms are reinterpreted or seeing or having no weight because this is the idea that um, you've got to explain the di you know a single diagnosis to explain everything. Well, you've got to actually put the other signs to, to, um, to, to one side then. Uh, but in, a, in, in a opposition to that is Hickam's dictum, and this basically principle says. Um, you should never exclude a diagnosis because it doesn't fit with a single explanation, and you may have multiple conditions. In this case, you had um, pre-existing HIV and then an overwhelming infection um, and a whole lot of conditions that had come from the HIV damage over her 10 years of life. 
Um, but what the basic principle of Hickam's dictum, that is where the mistake, in my view, happened in this case, was that um, you need to keep re revisiting a discarded diagnosis if evidence fails to, 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 assume, to fit your assumed diagnosis. So as doctors, we have a differential diagnosis, and then we decide it's this, and then we, we, we do investigations and, and more testing to see that, is it this? Um, and the difficulty can sometimes be to actually say, actually, it's not this, or it's more likely to be something else, and to go back and revisit. And you know, in this case, if they'd gone back and said, well, actually, there's so much sign of sepsis here. How do you explain sepsis at the same time as, you know, it's very coincidental that this child had all the sepsis and she, was, she had this profuse diarrhea at the same time that her father was supposed to have come into the room with her uh, sister sleeping in a bed, um, no history of George ever being violent in any way, way or form, and to have violently raped her and tried to suffocate her. Um, doesn't really, you know, it, it's, it's like they never revisited the, the improbability of that. Um, plus the fact that even though this child had never been diagnosed with HIV, um, clearly, from looking at her GP's reports in Zimbabwe, um, she, when she was born, she um, had failure to thrive, she had big glands. Uh, the GP clearly thought she had HIV, just read, um, he didn't say it, but reading, you know, talking, uh, uh, and the sort of treatment that he gave her. Um, and I'm sure this family must have suspected um, that, that this child was HIV positive. She was much smaller, always frail, poor health, uh, quite different from, her, from the rest of the family. Uh, she was a sort of special, uh, delicate little kid, really. Um, and so why on earth would her father choose to rape her when he doesn't have HIV and he thinks she does? And he was a vet. He was, he was the sort of chief vet for Harare before they came to New Zealand. Qualified med uh, medical guy, had done a master's in Oxford, I think. So he was... Um, he knew about um, uh, you know, um, HIV. There's no way. Why would he do this? It's just so weird. So, but anyway, the whole idea of revisiting the discarded diagnosis. Um, um, and the fact, in this case, that you had the interaction of the organ damage and her immune deficiency um, and all these damages happening to, you know, throughout her body. The, she, had a, she had a chronic um, brain, um, uh, a sign of chronic infection in her brain. And she'd actually been uh, not doing very well at school for the last year. She was clearly going downhill. Um, th 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 this was not just acute uh, stuff. She had a lot of chronic stuff as well, uh, with all this damage to her linings that the HIV was infiltrating and causing. And then it combined with an overwhelming it was, you know, um, inflammatory response to, to, to this whatever infection she got that, uh, that was her last illness. But there was this shared false perception um, that the doctors and the nurses, they thought they saw the 17-metre tear, um, and the, the emotional impact of this was that um, they couldn't get it out of their minds. And even the paediatrician at the second ev uh, trial, and she was being an expert witness on the stand, and she said there was this great gaping wound. And that's clearly, that was the shit, that, that was what they saw, and I'm sure that's still what they see, and that's still what they believe. Um, and it remained, so, so it remained, and... When you've got this misperception, it, it affects how you accept and reject and interpret your medical evidence. And so you selectively remember stuff that, 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 that confirms it. Um, and so you don't look at uh, alternative explanations. And it's the same phenomenon as false memories, really, that's sincerely believed in, and so it's very credible, um, and it's belief despite the lack of a conflicting evidence. Um, and the way, uh, the truth of a memory, um, it bears, so if we have a, if you generate something that, that, that didn't actually happen, but you believe it happened, the amount of confidence someone expresses in that memory that it's real, the amount of emotional intensity they have with it, and the amount of details about what they see or heard or, or felt or smelled, um, bears no relationship to the memory at all. So you can't tell the difference between a true and a false memory um, once, once, it's, once it's taken grip in your mind, really. Um, uh, so this just the more information you get, and the more you think about and dream about and talk about something, the more it becomes concrete in your mind. So in this case, the idea that this was a great gaping wound became really concrete in their mind. Um, and this is this is a quote from Carol Travis, who wrote that book, um, Mistakes Were Made. That memories create our stories, 
but our stories also create our memories. And once we have a narrative, we shape our memories to fit it. And that's sort of what happens in, in forensic cases as well. So, um, you, you, you need to be really wary of someone who thinks there is a sole explanation, and they say this is the definitive diagnosis, this is a case of trauma, rather than saying um, this might be a case of intentional injury, it might be a case of an accidental trauma, or it might be natural causes. They're the possibilities. And if, if you've got an expert who only says that and doesn't consider the others, then be wary. Um, um, that, that this case that was, you know, the death could have only been caused from attempted suffocation, not from the possibility of septic shock. Um, the fact that um, the sperm on the underbanks could only be from sexual assault, not that it might be from sexual assault, but it might also be from uh, innocent transfer. Um, and the refusal to consider that HIV was, was, was implicated, and yet, um, you know, they, the doctors admitted they'd never seen anything like this. And they knew nothing about how HIV um, can damage tissue linings um, and the loss of the, norm, uh, the normal response. It's how you get these very unusual infections. And that the thing about HIV, it manifests itself in bizarre ways that haven't been found. So every case is different. So you, can, you never see a case like this again, ever, because, because if it manifests, it, because it damages all your tissues at different rates. Um, anything can, it, it can present in any way at all, really. Um, there was, a lot of, there, there was a lot of stuff in this case about the prosecution argued that um, no case like this had ever been published. Um, but the, the, the medical literature, we tend to, we, case studies are actually the lowest level of what we publish. Um, uh, but um, the histopathologist, Sebastian Lucas and I, actually prepared a paper for peer review journal, actually because this is such an interesting case, to show how HIV damages tissues throughout the body. Um, and we discovered we couldn't publish it because even though he'd returned all the slides and the blocks, he still had these photographs of the slides. And the slides, by New Zealand law, um, belonged to the forensic pathologist who did the autopsy. And so we needed to have the consent of the pathologist to publish the, the, the pictures. Um, and it, they remain in his custody until there has been the inquest, which we still haven't had. Um, and at that point, um, it will go to his next of kin, and then we may be able to publish it. But, uh, um, but effectively, we can't publish. So you could, the, the Crown can say there's no, you know, there's, none of this is in the literature. Well, we found it extremely hard to get it into the literature. Yeah. So my key points are that um, belief in false perceptions gives, you, the, you, you become confident that it's true. Um, and even when you've got evidence of proving impossible, like there was no rectal tear, it doesn't shake the belief. Um, and it's reinforced when you've got what I call shared ID fixe. That means that this was a shared perception. It wasn't just one doctor who'd seen it, there were lots of doctors and nurses had seen and interpreted this as, as a wound. Uh, and therefore, these witnesses are very credible because they sincerely believe it. And this cognitive dissonance and this confirmation bias leads to the selective evidence. So my, finally, my suggestions um, that um, if, you, if you're looking for a, a scientific or medical advisor or expert witness, that the, way they, the best way, of, in my view, is how it should operate is that you look at a systematic chronological um, examination of the events from the available evidence. And you look and identify what are the bits that are missing. Um, and beware of an expert who claims a single cause. I mean, doctors, we should, we should have a differential diagnosis and we should have this is more probable than this, but not actually that there's definitively this. So think Hickam's dictum, not Occam's razor. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I did, sorry Tony. I did, didn't, tell, didn't tell I love time for questions, I'm sorry. Yeah, I could take questions. Yeah. Yeah, questions for Felicity? Is there any possibility of setting up a registered 
the question. Uh, can I just can I just do the question? Oh, will you repeat the question? Oh, I was going to repeat the, the question. Television. I was going to repeat the question. So the, the, the question is: Is there, uh, could there be a register of uh, available experts? Well, actually, there is an organisation called the Independent uh, Forensic um, I, I, IFP, Independent Forensic Practitioners Institute, um, which do have um, uh, uh, experts in a whole range of areas, um, but. Generally, there's not, you know, the, it's still very thin on the ground in terms of particular medical evidence. But yeah, there is FP, and um, you, can, you can Google them. Uh, the seven centimetre tear is a tear. Why wasn't it photographed? Sorry, I didn't hear that. The uh, seven centimetre tear is large. Why was it not photographed? Well, it was. I looked at the photographs. There was no seven centimetre tear. Because they had this belief in their minds, that's what they saw. And they didn't necessarily look at the photographs. They were doctors and nurses getting on with their business and being called as witnesses, although one of them was an expert witness. They didn't, they, they, even if they had looked at them, they probably would have seen it. It, it did look abnormal. It was red and horrible looking, but it, it, it wasn't bleeding and it wasn't a tear. But, I mean, I, you, I, it does seem very bizarre, but that, actually, that is actually what happened. Mark? In the aftermath of this case, Dr. Smith, and you are a member of the medical fraternity, are you optimistic that any of the people that were involved in the uh, collating of prosecution evidence have addressed their ideas and their approach to the case so that this may not happen as likely next year? The, the doctor, the, it, all of the doctors and the forensic pathologists in the case, I'm sure, truly believe that this girl was raped and murdered and that George got off. They, they, they haven't shifted their belief at all, in my view. I'm sorry, I didn't answer the question. Sorry, Felicity, you, you said about the forensic, independent forensic um, association, I think. Is, is there something you could give you an overall um, idea of what kind of experts you need? The question is, is there someone who can give you an overall view of what sort of expert you'd need? And, um, I mean, that's... I'm, I'm not working as an expert witness anymore because um, I don't want to go there anymore. It's... it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it, was, it was... I did enough already. But what I do do is work as a medical expert, a, an advisor, and so I will advise uh, the, the, the crime. Sometimes it's a phone call from a barrister, and that's all I do. Um, I don't really want to have hundreds of phone calls from barristers, but um, uh, uh, but 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 yeah. I mean, I did. I was not an expert witness in this case. I was the medical advisor. So I actually, the first case we decided, um, we thought we had a couple of experts, and they pulled out. They didn't want to give evidence against their colleagues. So we, did, we ran it without any experts. The second one, we needed them, so I decided what we needed, and I managed to access them, and the, the, they, you know, they got instructed by the barrister. So, yeah. Yes, could I just ask you, it would seem from the evidence um, and understanding of the case, that the Now, I think that's a really... The question is, why was, why was this not identified as a child with HIV and why wasn't she getting treatment? And I don't know, but I have some, some thoughts about that. Um, in Zimbabwe, she was getting antibiotics all her life, daily, that would prevent infection. Assumption was they must have thought she probably had HIV. When she came to New Zealand, the, the family came in stages, and the, the, the mother and the two girls came last, and the girls came in on a student visa, so they weren't actually tested for HIV because they were on student visas. My, and she'd only been here less than a year before she died. Um, but my suspicion is they were probably, my guess is, it's just this is a total guess, that they were afraid if they had her tested and proven HIV positive, they might send her back. She's only on a visa, student visa. What would the family do? They might have to pay for the drugs. They had no money. Would the country pay for it? But also the stigma of being HIV and what it would have done to Charlene if she'd known she'd been HIV 
was pretty huge. So that she'd actually, they'd actually been looking after caring for her. She was, she, she was actually, you know, surviving in, the, in, in her, her fragile little way. Um, that's my guess. But it is, I mean, if she had, when she came in, if she'd got the drugs a few months before she died, she might not have died. But she might still have, we don't know, we'll never know. But yes, it's, it, that, that to me is the really salient question. Because the family can say, hand on heart, we didn't know she had HIV, no one had ever tested her, no one had actually talked about it, but the, the web, they must have been pretty suspicious. <laughs> So what was the, uh, she, had, she, she, she had a temperature of over 40. Yes. She, was, she was incredibly febrile, and she had no recorded blood pressure, um, a thready pulse, uh, and as I say, this first diarrhea, gasping for breath. They're all the signs of, uh, of septic shock. And the temperature was not mentioned as, a, as something she presented with at, 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 in, the, in the record of death. With diarrhea? With diarrhea, yeah. No. So, talk about the ability of semen to transfer from one piece of clothing to another, like being washed. What other clothing was, um, was tested? Um, the oh, yeah, so what other, what other clothing was tested for semen? Um, originally, what had happened was that, um, that when they were going to take her back to the starship, uh, um, Safiso and one of her daughters raced back to the house to get a, a little bag because Safiso was going to go in the, um, in, in, the, in the helicopter with her. And while they were there, they stripped the bed and, um, uh, and the, all the stuff that was covered in diarrhea and threw it into the washing machine and washed it. And they put the washing machine on before they went back to the hospital. They, while they were there, the doctor, the pediatrician actually had, that was when they saw the, the tear. And so she rang them and said, uh, was there any blood on the sheets? And they said, oh, no, we didn't see any blood, only diarrhea. But um, uh, so the, the, the clothing that she was wearing, uh, and actually she was actually wearing the clothes that she'd been out, to, out on the night before, and she clearly had been feeling very unwell, and she got into bed unbeknown to them with all her clothing on. So the skirt and the top and everything had gone through the wash, and, uh, but it was a nylon skirt, I think, and it was, it was all tested, and none of it found, uh, none of the other um, things found um, uh, sperm or blood. But there was nothing that she'd been wearing that wasn't washed, because it had all just been thrown in the wash. Is that, does that answer? Yep. Um. <laughs> I'm sure that's public knowledge. <laughs> right up the back there. Do you think the um, expert witness structure in New Zealand, because uh, the way it's set up with the ESR and, and other things, means that, the, um, that because the Crown instruct them almost all the time that there's a, 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 a that, and therefore they're funded almost entirely by the Crown, that there's a bias towards them, and sometimes our expert witness structure in New Zealand has lost its bias a bit, has, has lost its independence a bit, become a bit biased? Well, I s there's such a narrow, it's such a, a limited pool. Uh, sorry, the, the question is, um, is there a sort of, a, the Crown can instruct all the expert witnesses and the, is there a bias to, you know, towards the Crown? Um, it's, I mean, most lay people will think if someone's charged, they're probably, they're probably guilty. And so working for the defence is, um, is, is not particularly attractive. Um, but there are, it is, it's very limited, and, it's, and everybody knows everybody else in a particular area. Um, so I think once you've got this, it, I, mean, I mean, ideally to me, you'd, what would have ha could have happened in this trial was the expert witnesses for the Crown in the second trial could have talked with the experts, in, uh, with the defence pre-trial and had a conference. Um, and that's what all the experts from England were, were, were expecting. And they thought if they'd had this conference and talked about it all, that actually it would be resolved and there would have been not a trial. But 
that, that, that didn't happen. It's not quite answering your question. Yes. What it seems in very large and complex cases, it seems in order for the defence to get some sort of alternative opinion, you have to go overseas and then you get to the cost factor yeah. and, and that just becomes so enormous, particularly with a lot of these things on legal aid. And, and you have that, that hurdle to get up. And it, was a, it was a huge hurdle in this case, which is why the first trial we decided we didn't need to do that. Um, and we didn't. Because we just thought the evidence would speak for itself once it was presented. But yes, there's, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to get New Zealand experts when you get into very specialised areas. Anna, have you got uh, something to add? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Felicity, thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Nice topic at, uh, over our coffee in the morning, <laughs> but uh, a really interesting case. And um, thank you very much for making yourself available.